I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 63, Media Training for PhD Students and yes, welcome to the truly beautiful Alice Springs. Now this vlog this week comes via request from my boss, the boss, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research at Flinders University, the wonderful Rob Saint. And Rob suggested to me the importance of PhD students thinking about their relationship with the media. And he asked that a vlog would be constructed on this topic, and your wish is my command, good sir. But let me start therefore with a scenario. And it happens to all of us as an academic. What happens is, suddenly you open your inbox and there's an email from a newspaper journalist, an editor, who wants a comment, who wants to talk to you to answer on a specific topic. Now, how are you going to handle that query? Conversely, you could be in your work office and the phone rings, you pick it up and it's a journalist who would like to conduct a live radio interview with you. Now, at its best, these types of journalists contact university media and communications departments, but frequently they don't. Frequently they do a direct approach to academics, and there's a lot of reasons that they do that. So, okay, you've picked up that phone, you've answered that email, what are you going to do next? So what I'm doing in this vlog is presenting six very quick and dirty tips for you, survival tips if you like, for how a PhD student can manage the media. And I'm particularly focusing on risk management in this vlog. I'm not going, all oh, this is fantastic, contribute to media, isn't it lovely, isn't it lovely to be flattered in this way? I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I'm focusing very strongly on risk management and how we avoid hurting your career permanently by something that you do in and with the media. And I do mean permanently because if you make a mistake these days, even in a local media environment, that mistake goes online and it follows you for the rest of your academic career. So if anyone Googles you, they will find that media mistake. And it may impact on consultancies, it may impact on employment. So let's go through the six risk management strategies. Very basic stuff, survival tips for you and your relationship with the media. Now number one, control what you can control. We focused a lot on these vlogs about focusing on you doing blogs, you thinking about your personal brand, your personal style, and how you project who you are as an academic to the world. And there's a reason for that. What I'm trying to do is help you all control the first three pages of Google returns. That's my priority for you. The first 30 entries that emerge in response to your name when placed into a Google search. Now, put your name into Google right now and see what the results are telling you and ask yourself how many of those returns, those first 30 returns, you actually control. And that's why I talk a lot about doing a blog, academia.edu, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, podcasts, so you're able to bulk out, fill out those 30 returns with the material over which you have control. Now, if you relinquish your media profile, then what your future employers are going to think about you is determined by people that are not you. So you start to lose control of your digital self. Important. Two, crucial, don't be flattered. This is huge. Uh, so many of the academics I know, their Achilles heel is that they get flattered so easily. They become flattered that a journalist has contacted them and asked them for an interview and flattered them in terms of their expertise. They get terribly excited if they get a quote in the Adelaide Advertiser. Mm -hmm. Now, don't be flattered. Many of you know I had my past career as a professor of media. I taught this stuff to journalists. I taught radio. I taught sonic media. And when I teach radio, the point is to fill up the time. So the host is simply on radio trying to fill up the time. And they're not too bothered 
how they fill up that time. They're not too bothered whether they're talking with an interesting PhD student or a pseudo-celebrity discussing their butt implants. It doesn't make any difference at all. So please, take the flattery out of the equation and ask yourself honestly, have you got something to say? Are you contributing to the public discourse or does this presentation help you develop your personal brand? Point three. Don't expect journalists to be prepared. Journalists are not your academic colleagues. Now this is important. Media presentations are not conferences. Journalists are not your colleagues. They have no specialist knowledge on your topic. The host may read a press release if you're lucky, they may flick into Wikipedia if you're lucky, just as often a host is fed questions from their assistant in the booth. So all journalists are focused on either filling up the time, filling up the pages, filling up the columns as quickly and as easily as possible, or getting a juicy quotation from you that may start up a talkback or start up a controversy, do a bit of clickbait. So therefore, you need to enact preparation. Try at all times to avoid doing an immediate live interview. Still happens to me where someone gets on the phone and says, could you do an interview now? To which I always respond, no. Do you want to do an interview now? Really not. Because what you need to do, every interview you undertake takes 30 minutes of preparation. You need to be in control of your brief. What is the topic that they're asking you to explore? Who is the audience? Be very conscious. The audience for radio at six o'clock in the morning is different from the afternoon slot, which is different from drive time. So who is the audience for the content you are delivering? The trick I always teach people, this is tips and tricks, is on a card just like this, write five key points. So before you do any interview, any discussion, any media appearance, have the five key ideas written on a card. So why that matters so much is journalists will ask all sorts of random stuff, either because they've got no idea what they're talking about or they are trying to trick you. So whatever question they ask you, always make sure that you bring it back to your content, to those five key ideas that you wrote on the card. Point four, slow down and use asynchronous media. Now interviewers have particular goals and they are not your goals. So what I want you to do in any media experience is hold on to your goals. What are you trying to get across? And yes, one key strategy I've already talked about, write those five key points on a card. But the other strategy I use and advise to every single person I talk to and train about this is use email in media presentations as often as you can. Now this is really, really, really important. I rarely, like ever these days, give a journalist a live call interview. I very rarely do it. So if I do, I state, so I'm talking in my office at work, I say, uh, just for the record, I'm recording my side of this telephone conversation. So if I am doing a live interview, I say, I'm recording the live side, my side of this conversation. And if you misrepresent me, I will report you to your editor and I will report you to the press council. And that's not a bluff, I mean it, and needless to say it focuses their mind somewhat. You see, I work with journalists via email and what I state to be honest is, oh look I'm so sorry I'm in and out of the office today with all sorts of different meetings, how about you write the questions for me in an email and I'll give my answers back to you. So this is beneficial for a lot of reasons. You have control over the questions and the answers. You can think about those answers rather than respond with adrenaline. And also you have control, you have a record of what you've stated, so it avoids you being misrepresented. Crucial. It also stops you being tricked 
or being lured in a live experience. It also avoids a setup. I've been through a lot of media setups, so Steve, don't think that media beat ups and setups don't happen. They do. You get lured to go in and speak about a book and somebody else magically arrives and it's a debate. So always be aware of that. So you have to be really media savvy to work with live media and even experienced people like me can make a mistake. You've got to back yourself if you're doing live media and you're there because it's often a tabloidized story. So be careful. Use asynchronous media like email as often as you can. Five, learn to say no. It is wrong, so wrong to say yes to media requests because of flattery. If it's not your area of expertise, say no. My great mentor, the wonderful Professor Graham Turner, always said to me, academics make mistake after mistake after mistake because they get flattered and they speak outside of their expertise. So what I want you to do is be very clear, list down the areas of your expertise, the areas on which you feel very comfortable offering a commentary and be clear so when requests emerge outside of those areas, you simply kick them to touch. Six, the big one. Local is not local. Remember, the internet allows your content to travel. Now, it's important. Bad or inexperienced journalists work in local media. The first job for most journos is in the local media. So you're, in fact, dealing with the worst journalists in the local media environment. So what happens is these local journalists talk to a PhD student, conduct a local interview, and then put it online and it has an international audience and is returned through Google searches. So your quotations can be found through any rudimentary Google search and this is completely different. So in the old days, 20 years ago or so, we could do a local interview with some local rag and it would disappear within a day. So your mum would go, oh geez, why'd you say that? But like, it was your mum. And a day later, everyone would have forgotten about it. But of course now, that's simply not the case. And it is important you recognise the change. Local is not local. So if it is possible, just simply don't deal with the local media. I know I'm being harsh and hard here, but start to work at the highest levels that you can. National media, and particularly the international media. Remember, you are an expert, you are not a celebrity. Okay, there are two reasons to do media work. One, important, you wish to contribute to the public discourse, fantastic. Two, you want to brand yourself as an academic in a particular area of expertise and allow that to feed your career. Both those reasons are excellent. Now, if you would like me to create a more bespoke, a larger training module, if you will, on PhD students in the media, or present another vlog, if you like, on a specific area, I'm very, very happy to do that. Because in Europe, it is incredibly common that PhD students do training packages on how to handle the media. If you put it into Google, you will see PhD students and the media. It's a very common strategy. So if it is something of use to you, please contact me and I will deliver that. And thank you to DVCR Rob Saint for this great request. So as, all lad all, as always, ladies and gentlemen, from the lovely, glorious Alice Springs during sunrise, I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.